I'm here today with Charlie Can. Thank you very much, Charlie, for for coming in today and uh, and talking a little bit. My pleasure. It's nice to see you, and I'm happy to reconnect with the Gilman family. So, over the past couple of years since we started the podcast, it seems like you've you've tuned in a little bit and followed some of the the guests that we've had here and spoken with, and um, you know, and, and we've talked a little bit about maybe getting you in to have a conversation. So I'm glad that we're finally making it happen. Me too. You're one of the uh, positive legacies of the pandemic. <laughs> You're a good example of my philosophy that there are always silver linings in challenging times. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it was, uh, I think that was a good time to start something like this because it, it really did allow me to, and Chesare, to connect with some people when it was so isolating, right? Right. We had school online. I remember teaching in my apartment, and uh, it was a, such a weird time. But um, it's good to to have kept it going in the last couple of years. So, Charlie, um, just tell me maybe a little bit about your upbringing and what it was like the first time that you stepped foot on Gilman's campus, because I know you're a class of '88 alum here and. You stay very connected, even though you're up in Connecticut at Suffield Academy. But what was your upbringing like, and and maybe the first, you know, first time you came to Gilman's campus? I can tell you some of the things I remember. I I went to Elmhurst uh, Nursery School in Hamden, which I don't think exists anymore. But uh, several of my classmates went with me to Gilman, and we lived in a school uh, in a house that. Gilman now owns on the corner of Roland Avenue and Northern Parkway. Uh, so I literally walked across the street to school for 12 years. And in the primary and middle school years, I remember um, some teachers that were very um, formative for me. Uh, Mrs. McDonald was my first grade teacher and Mrs. Brune was my third grade teacher. Mr. Merrick was really memorable. Uh, Mr. Schmick actually was my fifth grade teacher uh, earlier in his career, obviously. Uh, and then in middle school, people like Mr. Rogers and Mr. Martin were really um, helpful to me as teachers and coaches. And then as I got into upper school, I remember uh, several coaches. Uh, Mr. Holly and I are still close friends. He was my basketball coach. Um, and I remember Mr. Martin coaching us in lacrosse and um, um, Mr. Um, Taggart was a great basketball coach for me in the sub varsity, he really helped build my confidence. Mr. Christian, I'm forever grateful that he taught us to take a charge and play defense. And then some teachers that really had an um, impact on me like Mr. Duncan and um, Mr. Merrill, who I thought was just a terrific teacher. and. Uh, fortunately, Mr. Downs, who um, encouraged me to be an English major in college, which I was a little hesitant about because um, many of my friends were taking more angular paths, and I was uh, a little envious of that, whether it was finance or econ or architecture or pre-med. So I didn't know if an English degree would would be, serve me well enough in my future, and, and thank goodness I did that because my whole career has been about communicating well and quickly and writing and speaking and inspiring other people. So I'm always grateful to Mr. Downs for that. Was English something that you uh, were attracted to or grasped really quickly when you were a student in, in high school, or is that something that flourished more when you went to Michigan? Um, well, actually, in high school, I liked reading and writing a lot. I liked my humanities courses. And uh, Gilman encouraged me to go to Kenyon College, where I started my um, higher ed career, because I wanted to play Division Three lacrosse, and I wanted to be a writer at the time. And um, I did go there, and I liked it very much. I just felt like something was missing, and um, I wanted a bigger national university feel, and applied to several schools, and went to Michigan. And it was a, it was a very formative experience for me personally and educationally, and that's a very big part of my life still. Both of our children went to Michigan. I'm, I'm very involved in the school. A lot of Suffield kids go to Michigan. That's important to me also. Yeah, Michigan is one of those massive schools that, you know, I see the Michigan hat in your background. And you, whenever you see someone walking around with Michigan stuff, you just, you know that they are, you know, it, it reminds me a lot of Penn State. I know they're both really big schools, but I'm from Pennsylvania. And 
every single person that I've ever talked to that went to Penn State absolutely loved the place and, you know, wears Penn State around and roots for their football team and are just kind of diehards. And I feel the same way about Michigan, even though I've never really been there or stepped foot on the campus. I just know that it's the type of place that you always, you know, always support if you if you go there. I, I really haven't met too many people who didn't like their experience there. I've had that experience personally and feel the same way. The school spirit is immense and we're very supportive of all our children's goals, except if they ever wanted to go to Ohio State. <laughs> um, what was it like uh, studying English? I, I guess I'd say, too, about Gilman. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a head of school for 20 years now and I've been at Suffield for 30 years. So um, I live and work with adolescents and it's a complicated period of time. It's a time of immense change physically and emotionally and, and at schools like Gilman or Suffield at the same time you're being saddled with very serious academic expectations. So um, some of the things that I found hard at Gilman and um, had reservations about have really shaped how I want Suffield to feel. And I bring that into my work as a, as a school leader. But as I um, grew distance from Gilman, I, I only grew fonder. I, I liked it very much, but now I'm just so grateful and appreciative for the academic foundation and the personal foundation and, and the investment of the people that are committed to the school. So what was it about your time at Gilman in terms of the culture of the school that made such an impact on you, you know, years later? Um, there's much more cultural diversity in Baltimore than there is in, in Hartford, in, in my area of Connecticut, which is pretty rural. And um, I'll never forget that a lot of my close friends were taking two or three buses to get to Gilman and how um, much the school meant to them. And uh, there was a great awareness among many of my friends of what a privilege it was to go to the school, which is rare for kids that age to realize how fortunate they are. I think we all knew that at a young age. And then, of course, um, the role that Mr. Finney played, we should probably talk about that. As, as a, a student, it was more from a distance. You would just feel his presence. And I knew his investment in the school, uh, but I certainly know it more as a school head. Um, and I think about it all the time because it shapes my work. You have to really be all in all the time, especially at a school like ours, which is largely residential. So. 70% of our students live here at school. So I'm eating all my meals in the dining room with them. I see them at nights. We have Saturday classes. So Saturday feels like Tuesday here. It's There's no separation of leaving on Friday. And these students are really um, sophisticated and savvy, and they can tell who's totally invested and who isn't. You can't fake it. Mm -hmm. and I felt that from Mr. Finney all the time. and. Uh, so in my later years of our relationship, it was through correspondence. He would write to me periodically. And I actually found two of the letters uh, this morning as I was looking for them because they were in my head. And I have about 20 binders of 20 years of correspondence. The first was a year after I became the head. It was uh, October 12th, 2005. And he said, uh, Dear Charlie, this is a belated note of congratulations to you on your appointment and installation of, as Suffield Academy's headmaster. I'm absolutely convinced you are doing an excellent job. Indeed, I have already heard very positive reports from friends in this regard. It is not an easy job, but you have the sensitivity and leadership skills to beautifully meet the challenges of the office. You have also had most valuable experience and you know the school well. I wish you every success and personal fulfillment. May the great creator continue to guide and support you with warmest personal regards, Reddy Finney. Wow, that's awesome. And then about 10 years later, January 23rd, 2013, he said, I was pleased to read the Suffield 2012 annual report. I think Mrs. McDonald probably gave him all the publications because uh, her granddaughter, Dee Dee, went to Suffield, David McDonald's uh, daughter, David went to Gilman too. It's full of interesting and impressive information. It reflects a most positive spirit and an obvious, very caring hand of influence. I just wanted to write to express my feelings and congratulate you on your most impressive school with warmest regards and continued blessings and success. 
Very sincerely, Redmond Finney. And I, I, I must say, I was kind of surprised at the time how much it meant to me. By that time, I was interacting with hundreds of Suffield alums and parents. And um, I think about it a lot now as alums from Suffield ask for help with their career and going to weddings and now meeting their children, some of whom are already at Suffield. So it's very powerful in his impact. And something I, I want to talk about near the end is um, I learned later in his life and in my life that we share a love of the state of Maine. Mm. And I didn't know that as a kid. Um, I guess the last thing I'd say about Gilman is I'm really pleased to see several of my classmates so involved with the school. I know some of them have served or are currently serving as trustees and several have kids there, but people like Brooks Kitchell and um, Charlie Edwards and Chip Linehan and David Carroll. And I think Eric Bryant's now involved with the alumni council. So that's, that's really great because that's a connection between the past and the future, and the destiny of the school. Well, I didn't know Brooks Kitchell was your class. So his son Brooks is my advisee, which is pretty cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, so what do you think it was about, I guess, Gilman when you were here that really influenced you so much? Because a lot of the mission here is to instill character values in the boys so that when they get out into the world, they're prepared and, you know, strong in character. And how do you think that really happened? Because it seems like a lot of your professional life now, you're looking back and thinking about how Gilman, you know, prepared you for to become an academic and a head of school and a leader, um, but maybe you didn't really realize it when you were here in high school, which I think is very hard to do. You know, you're 17, 18 years old and you're graduating and you're excited for the next step, but I think it's cool how you're looking back on your time as a Gilman boy. Um, I think that it, it clarified to me that while um, through the, through the things that went well for me at Gilman and the relationships that were most positive for me with teachers, um, that while um, structure and rigor are essential, um, encouragement is too. And so that really shapes who I hire to work at Suffield and the way I want Suffield to feel is very uplifting and supportive, even though our students are very ambitious and we're really ambitious for them and their future. I just feel that um, relating to them, meeting them where they are and helping them travel great distance personally and academically is really the heart of the mission. So again, I learned that from what went well for me at Gilman and what didn't go as well. I think one thing that I, I noticed when I was looking at Suffield's website is um, the tradition that Suffield values. And I think you could say the same thing about Gilman. Um, Suffield founded 1833, but uh, you you do tend to reach back, I think, and just from I can see on, on the website and through my research is you reach back into the roots of the school and, you know, you can connect with certain traditions there at, at Suffield. Yes, and you figure out what's um, non-negotiable and timeless and works and where you should evolve. So we have a dress code. We have sit-down lunch where, with assigned seating that changes every week. We have small classes, we have a strong advisor program, we have Saturday classes, we have evening study hall for boarders. Those things are time tested and they work, but we um, have far more options in the arts than when I came. We have far more ways to meet your afternoon commitment if you don't wanna play interscholastic sports. There's all kinds of alternatives now. Uh, so the school evolves. We have a four year college counseling program that's very developmental and sequenced and innovative. We have a leadership training program that's part of the curriculum for each student every year. So we're always trying to stay steadfast on the core parts of the school, but add value. Can you tell me a little bit about the leadership training program? Because that's one thing I noticed that, that seemed interesting. Yeah, that's we're a nine through 12 school. Let me tell you a little bit about Suffield to start. We have 420 students. Um, in grades 9 through 12. They come from around the country and the world, from 25 states and 20 countries. 70% uh, are boarding. Uh, as I said, we have school from 8 to 3, sports essentially 3.30 to 5.30, study hall at night. And we have three 10-week terms because we have longer breaks because our students are traveling. 
distances to get home for Thanksgiving and the winter holidays and spring break. Um, the, the leadership program is uh, in the curriculum twice a week in grades nine and 12. A traditional course meets four times a week, two long blocks and two short. The leadership is one long and one short. In the ninth grade, it's focused on personal mastery, a public speaking, time uh, management, uh, really adjusting to high school and boarding school. In the 10th grade, it turns to um, community service and each student uh, executes a project in the community. In 11th grade, the heart of it is college prep. We have a 10 week program for our juniors as we really ramp up the college search on building resumes, practice interviews, using our web-based software, planning their visits. And then in the senior year, so there's time in the curriculum for the college counselors to work with our students, which is very helpful. And then in the senior year, each senior has at least one formal leadership role, uh, whether it's Storm Proctor, team captain, student council, student newspaper, several have more than one, but each has at least one piece of the rock to help lead the community. We also ask them each to make a senior speech, which I stole from my experience at Gilman. So each Monday we have a school meeting and seven or eight seniors give a talk. And through the course of the year, we get through all 120 of them. Wow. Did you, did you give a senior speech when you were here at Gilman? I did. I remember it. What'd you, what'd you talk about? I spoke about Doug Williams being the first black quarterback in the Super Bowl. Huh. Why? And Doug Williams saying, I'm the quarterback of the Washington Redskins and my color has nothing to do with it. And it was just a powerful moment for the country and it's great. Yeah, I love that tradition here, having the seniors give some parting words before they leave because I think, you know, I think public speaking is really important and it's something that I don't think I had much experience with when I was in high school and even college. I, I don't think I had to speak in front of people too much, but you know, now that I'm, I'm teaching and I'm speaking in front of people every day, I just think that that skill of being able to be comfortable in front of others is, you know, is, it's really important. And I think it starts, it starts in the classroom, but it also carries over to the tradition of having senior speeches. Agreed. And we don't have uh, 12 years with each other the way some Gilman students do. So you really get to know some people better in their journey to how they got here and what their experience has been like here through that vehicle. So when did Suffield become so international? Was that, um, has that been the case for a while now? It seems like you draw from, you know, you said 20, 20 different countries, 25 different countries. Yeah. Uh, and that's pretty common in New England boarding schools since about the late eighties. So we have about, we have of, of the 420, about 20% of our students are domestic students of color and about 18% uh, are international. And then the rest, as I said, come from mostly the Northeast. Most kids who go to boarding school are within a two or three hour radius, but there are pockets of students here from California, Texas, Florida. Uh, usually their families are familiar with boarding school. So you've been, you've been in, in charge there as head for about 20 years, I think, right? Yeah, I came here right out of Michigan to teach English and coach lacrosse and be a dorm parent. And I figured I'd stay here two or three years and then figure out the next step. And uh, two things happened. First, um, I met my father-in-law. He, he taught at Suffield for 54 years. He was a legendary member of the faculty. And we got very friendly. And um, his daughter was home for Thanksgiving, and I met her. And we've been married for 26 years now, <laughs> running the school together. So it's it's a family commitment, very much. And um, our roots, her roots, are even deeper than mine at Suffield. And then the second thing that happened is my predecessor started to groom me. He asked me to move um, first to be the director of admissions, and then I uh, was the assistant head. I oversaw admissions and development. I learned a lot about fundraising and I learned a lot of stuff, uh, met a lot of Suffield alums. And then I was the dean of faculty for a year. And then um, in 2002, I was 30, 32, I think. I started getting calls, 30, from headhunters about school head positions. And it was happening earlier in our lives than we anticipated. And um, one day I went to see the head to ask for his advice and the board president happened to be here 
and I told I told them what was going on and they started laughing and I said what are you what are you guys laughing about and they said well we're leaving soon and you're staying we just haven't told you the plan <laughs> uh, so we had two years in 2002 the board announced to the community that David Holmes, my predecessor, was going to stay till 2004. And at that point, I would be the head. So there wasn't a search. It was internal. I had two years to really um, just watch him and see how he handled personnel issues, discipline issues, fundraising, all the pieces of the job and think about what I would do similar or differently. And so in 2004, I became the head. And there's essentially been um, three stages in my tenure. The first, we were 300 students when I became the head, and we wanted to be 400. So we grew about 20 students a year for five years, and we had to build out the campus to accommodate 400 students. We needed a new classroom building. We had one basketball court for five teams, so we built a field house. We, we needed more space. Uh, and that was, um, we were also building the applicant pool at that time. We didn't, we didn't have tons of demand. The next phase was around uh, 2011 or so to 2016. And that's when we got much more ambitious for the school. We wanted to build several new facilities, build, uh, bring some facilities from the uh, 1950s into the 21st century. Uh, we wanted to build the endowment uh, so we got much more ambitious and were successful in that period. Uh, we raised over $100 million for buildings. Our applicant pool went from about 500 to over 1,000 students. We started to ask much more strategic questions uh, about the school, and, that, and that's kind of where we are now. We're trying to aggressively build our resource base to provide more access. Last year, we had $6 million of financial aid to 40% of our families. Uh, our endowment has grown from about 12 million to almost 80. Hmm. So we're, I'm trying to, with others, get the school to a more sustainable place. And 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 what's interesting about that um, is during those stages, the first stage you're trying to generate enough tuition revenue to make sure the operations work and everybody can get paid. The second stage you're starting to think about what would your school look like if you could decide that if you could say this is what the ideal enrollment enrollment would be and now it's um we're really at that stage we with 1100 kids for 120 spots we're really saying what are our goals for the school as they relate to the academic program college placement cultural diversity the the um, feel of the school and can we somehow reverse engineer that applicant pool to be reflective of those goals. Where does athletics fit in? That's a big question that we ask, and those things are interrelated. And maybe as we talk about some challenges and opportunities for independent schools in general, we could chat more about, about those topics and college placement. So when you get together to express your vision or come up with some of these questions, do does a lot of, uh, does your vision come from I would assume the competition of the other boarding schools in that region and how to differentiate yourself at Suffield, or do you kind of ha have a vision in your mind almost naturally as a leader about how you'd like to see your school in the next, you know, 10 to 15 years? Like where does that motivation to, uh, to make change and to ask these questions really come from? Yeah, it comes uh, from our values that Hillary and I have. And, and one of the reasons we've stayed at Suffield so long is the school gave us an opportunity to infuse our own um, values in this community. Of some of the things I mentioned before, of rigor and um, structure, but also intense encouragement and vibrant school spirit. And yes, part of it is also figuring out where you fit in the landscape of peers of how Suffield compares to the schools that we most frequently uh, recruit students against, like Berkshire and Salisbury and Taft and Deerfield and Loomis Chafee and Westminster and Avon Old Farms and Miss Porter's and the, the pantheon of schools in the greater Hartford area. Uh, and what we found is the recipe we have of um, great school spirit, a lot of support, 
good college placement, immaculate facilities. It seems to really be resonating, particularly right now. Why do you think that is? Because I think, um, unfortunately, schools, what schools like Gilman and Suffield do is unfortunately at this moment, almost countercultural to um, avoid extremism, but celebrate diversity to expect rigor and um, a high bar of conduct from students and appropriate use of social media and to um, ask students to be involved in many parts of the community that is running counter to what most people are seeing in the greater society so our schools are becoming more appealing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially schools with very clear sense of purpose so I'm finding the demand is stronger than ever before, but some of the operations are harder to deliver on because the the asks of our students are so different from the asks of their peers or what they're doing in the rest of their lives. Can you talk a little bit more about that that vision of rigor and structure? Because I think that's really important too, and I think that's something where both Gilman and um, – and, and Suffield, it's something we both have in common and, and something that separates us from the different schools, just as you were saying. But I think it's I, I would just think that that's common, you know, education. It, it's like a common vision for educators that you need structure, you need rigor, kids need boundaries. And, and why is that idea so countercultural today? I mean, it just seems like common sense to me. Well, our schools are very inefficient, I'd say intentionally. I mean, we have nearly 200 employees here for only 420 students. So, I mean, it's never again in their lives will our students have so many people concerned about their well-being mm -hmm. and asking them how they're doing. And that is wonderful, but it also can be a little grating for a 16-year-old to have all these adults so involved in their lives. It takes a certain type of young person to really embrace that. Right. And I think, you know, when when you get out into the world and even college, you're not going to have teachers, you know, asking for your homework as often or seeing if you need help or inviting you in, you know, for one on one guidance on a paper. Um, that's something that is is really a privilege that we have and we provide here at Gilman and in Southfield, I think. Yes. So I find myself um, in my work focused on five or six areas all the time. And if um, other areas start to creep in, I try to remove them and stay zeroed in on those five. And, and those are really consistently articulating the mission and core principles of the school to all of our constituents, uh, instilling um, a great sense of pride in the school through my energy and through the maintenance of the plant, making sure that it's clean and immaculate and well-maintained and that we have a strong applicant pool and um, hiring great faculty members who not only love working with um, young people, but share our philosophy as a school. And, and we have a very talented senior administrative team that's been very stable. Um, so I don't really get too involved, for example, with the um, curricular matters. I don't really know that textbooks our science department is using or the sequence of courses particularly that well in math because I have colleagues that know much more than me about that. I try to make sure they have the resources to inspire. And so whether that's by raising money to get great kids here whether it's by raising money to make sure we have great salary and benefits for our faculties to sustain them during different parts of their career. So when we hire a young teacher, we fully fund their grad school. For our mid-career faculty, um, we have childcare on campus. For those who stay a while, we have uh, tuition remission. Um, nearly all of our faculty live here because we're a residential school. So we own about 65 or 70 units, about half are in the dorm and the other are apartments or freestanding homes in Suffield. So the goal is to hire great people and nurture them through the stages of their personal and professional lives. When you're hiring, say, a young teacher or a teacher from outside of Suffield, uh, what kind of questions do you ask that person to make sure that their values are in line with the values that we talked about of 
rigor and enthusiasm and structure? Um, everybody will tell you in an interview that they have a lot of tools in the toolbox and can work with a wide range of kids and they want to be nurturing and they want to be supportive, but you really have to drill down on, give me some examples of how you do that and how you handle adversity. Uh, the other thing at, at boarding school that's very unique in hiring is, um, I know that Gilman still embraces the uh, teacher coach model, but our, our um, openings become narrow very quickly. So if we have a math opening and we need a girls soccer coach, who can live in a single dorm unit, it makes 90% of the applicants not gonna work. So some of it is how do we fit in and meet the needs of the school? Because when you're a school of 420, you know you're not getting bigger. You also know exactly what your program needs are. We have 220 sections. We know which sports we offer, which we don't. A good school really knows what it, what it doesn't do as much as it knows what it does. Uh, so some of those sections might change more AP, more honors, but the 220 isn't going to really change because we're not adding a ton more tuition each year, just whatever the increase is. Makes sense. Um, what are some of the issues or things that are on your mind recently in terms of uh, the way that the school functions in kind of your day to day life? Like, what do you think about on a, on a daily basis? in the last couple of weeks? Um, I think about um, re-emerging re from the pandemic and getting back to um, some sense of normalcy and at a time when um, what we thought was normative behavior that could be expected, you're not sure you can expect it anymore because there's been dramatic social change at the same time. Uh, there's very divisive political issues in the country uh, so our students are bombarded with forces and trying to provide regularity and emphasizing things, as I said, that seem so countercultural about being kind and supportive. And it, it's really a grind. I'm really paying much more attention to the day-to-day -day management and culture of the school than I did before our world changed so dramatically. So I'm traveling less, I'm spending more time on campus with our students and faculty, and I'm just trying to get us back to a sense of, of I, I don't think we're ever gonna get back to pre-pandemic rituals, but to um, a little bit more of a rhythm. Yeah, that makes sense. And and you bring up an idea that I, I'm curious about too, post-pandemic and in the world that we're in, uh, what is kind of your vision for a sense of unity at your school? Like you've got social media on one hand and, and the distraction or the, just the reality of phones and, and technology, right? You see just the way that everyone walks around with their phones and their ear pods in and, you know, and then you've got the political divide, which you mentioned post COVID, which I think everyone is a little bit more reliant on technology and use of technology. And there's a lot of, you know, additional effects of the pandemic that we see on a daily basis. And I think, you know, as a leader, like what, what do you think about in terms of the vision for, you know, what the school population looks like amidst all of these, um, I don't know what you would call them, but barriers. Um, we have to just keep at it and we have to keep our faculty mindful that this, these are not Gilman specific or Suffield specific issues. We're operating in a much larger universe, but um, basic things, I, I mean, um, our students still wear a necktie like yours, but most professionals do not wear a necktie now. And when we say you, you have to be at school every day as a teacher or a staff member, when most of our parents are working remotely a large part of the time. What we're doing is becoming increasingly countercultural. And that's my point. It's not a value judgment. It's just that our schools are different than what's happening mm -hmm. uh, beyond our, our boundaries. I really like the motto at Suffield um, to, to be, not to seem, right? Yes. Essay quam videri. How do you, uh, how do you communicate that vision or that motto to the, to the student body and why is it so important? Because it's about a lack of pretense and authenticity and um, what we value here, which is um, being a good citizen, being kind and supportive of others and 
still being ambitious about all of your goals for the future. Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, awesome. Well, let's let's maybe get back to kind of your career path a little bit because that's something that interests me. You were an English major and you you love studying English. Why do you think why do you think that uh, study or that domain of academics really put you on the path to becoming a, a leader of a school, humanities? I think it, it, it's mostly related to communications, to being able to um, most of many of the most successful people that I have met or been mentored by have an ability to explain complicated topics in an easy to understand way. Um, my first board chair was a Goldman partner, and he um, he had degrees in finance and econ, but he told me that his most valuable was in psychology. And he, he knew how to um, read and connect with other people. And he helped me understand the balance sheet of the school very quickly, things that I didn't quite come as naturally to me as a, as a student of reading and writing. And then what happened um, when they asked me to be the head, I went to um, a man who was on the board named Dan Tish, whose family uh, owns Lowe's Corp, which is a hotel and um, insurance conglomerate. Um, and he had gone to Suffield and his son was my advisee. And I said, Dan, if, if we um, if Hillary and I do this, would you help us? Because you could really help the school, and I don't want to be the youngest former head of school. I want to be successful, <laughs> and our chances are better if you're part of this. And he agreed, and he was the board president for uh, 12 years, and he helped us really elevate our ambition for what Suffield could be, and validated the school in New York, which was very helpful for student recruitment. Um, and and the only time Hillary and I ever thought of really really thought closely about leaving. Um, was when our kids were in primary school. I think Peyton, our daughter, was 10, and our son Harrison was six. And we don't really have an elementary independent school around us. It's about 40 minutes to the, the closest, Renbrook School, which is where Davina Bala went. Mm -hmm. um, so I, and I thought it might be interesting to run a K-12 school and expand my experience. So we looked very closely at a school in California um, we we went out as a family to look and it just we couldn't leave the roots that we had built here, both Mr. Tish, especially some other people that I felt a great obligation to that had been so helpful to me and, and Hill and her parents were here at the time. Since then, we've never really considered. So our kids did fine in the, in the Suffield schools, and they looked at several schools that ultimately both went to Suffield, and it worked really well for both of them. And that was helpful to see the school as a parent because they both learned very differently and had different routes through here, and it worked well for both of them. So that, that was very helpful for me as the head to see it as a parent as well. So uh, in terms of recruiting or, or admissions at Suffield, what kinds of students are you really looking for as you know good fits for the school like what's the typical student that goes to suffield they're a good student they can handle academic rigor but within that band there's a somewhat wide range um i i think it's important for the school to have strong athletics so that's important to me so um Every student doesn't have to be an athlete, but we need enough that our teams can be very competitive because I think it's important for school spirit. It's important for the relationship uh, with our students and parents and faculty. It's uplifting when they're part of something that's successful. And it's also extremely helpful with college placement. Uh, so that's an area of focus. Um, essentially, if we're gonna offer a program, I want it to be successful. It doesn't have to be the best, but we're often recruiting or shaping our enrollment towards our programs. So we have uh, sophisticated arts programs and I need, we need some kids that can excel in those areas. And uh, most importantly, I want um, for all of our students, regardless of their background, I want them to be in a diverse classroom because I think it makes for a better learning environment. So it's not just about opening doors of opportunity for those who can't afford to go to Suffield otherwise, it's beneficial for our wealthy kids too. 
to, to be in an environment that's truly diverse. So all of those are priorities. Love it. Yeah, I think I think Gilman's mission aligns very closely with that. We have the the teacher coach model and very reliant on our sports teams as you know ways to build character right on on the sports fields but also as community builders we've got the silent night basketball game coming up on on friday night and you know some of these traditions and um i think i think the reaching back aspect to the athletic programs of the past is really interesting you know you can connect with the you know the, the people that come out to our lacrosse games for instance who played lacrosse here back in the 70s and i i think the the community building piece of different programs, not only sports, is something that makes these places really special. Yes, I agree. And and um, you're you're um, in an era where we're where college placement and, and counseling is very complicated, with threats on affirmative action, important questions about legacy preference, standardized test optional applications. Um, the role of athletics is, um, for some reason, under less um, exposure. So your alma mater is a great example. I heard this last week that 1% of Harvard's applicant pool are recruited athletes and 10% of Harvard's incoming class are recruited athletes. Mm -hmm. So if, you're, if your school is serious about um, helping students get into highly selective schools, there's just no question that uh, athletics is a vehicle to do that. Now, the question is, how much does that contort your school? And we're seeing some of that in New England, because because we have um, at Suffield, it's complicated because we only have 220 boys in the whole school. So to have a football team like ours with kids that go to Clemson and Miami and Michigan, on top of schools like Penn and the NESCACs, I mean, it's the team comes out for the game and you say, where's the rest of the team? It's only 35 guys, but the, the top 10 are, are among the top in the country. Hmm. Uh, but what we are seeing, I know you're a lacrosse coach in, in New England lacrosse. It's it's fierce. I mean, you look at some of the teams at the top, the Taft, Salisbury's, Deerfields, Brunswick's, and I have some worries that it's a school within a school that it's a lot of reclassified kids from a national recruiting footprint. And it's, it's um, the question is, how does that fit within that school? So Suffield, I ask a lot of those questions all the time is we have to meet these ambitions, but this is one cohesive school community and we have to make decisions that ensure that in the future. Yeah, I think the recruited athlete aspect, and, and I can only really speak to lacrosse because that's the, that's the one I know, but um, the the lengths that people are willing to go to to become recruited um, are pretty astronomical. I mean, you see a lot of club lacrosse players now. You know, their lacrosse takes up their entire life. It's like a full time job. And even when I was in high school, I you know I played lacrosse in the summer. I played a couple tournaments. But now, if you're on a club lacrosse team, that is the vehicle that's going to get you to the division one school that you want to play at in large part, not for everybody, but for some people. And, and I think club lacrosse programs and probably club sports in general have realized this and, you know, they practice all the time. They've got five, five tournaments in the summer. It's just, it, it's such an arms race for a lot of, uh, for a lot of parents, and, and, and parents don't really even know what to do because there aren't really other options. It's not like there's a rec program that you can join and find a middle ground. It's like if you're going to play lacrosse, you're playing lacrosse from fifth grade to 12th grade all the time. And uh, in, in some ways, that's it's, it's difficult because it's not really as well-rounded as we're talking about a full education is. Like guys are – that's all they're thinking about is their club lacrosse team. And um, – it's hard to see because I know how important it is to, to practice and put all your work in on the field. But at the same time, it, it, it's getting, you know, too much in some places. Yeah. And it's also, as I was thinking about Gilman, um, as much as I remember some experiences as a varsity athlete, I also really remember formative points along the way, like our fifth grade football game against Calvert. That was, that really helped shape 
your notion of competition and I'll never forget a JV soccer um, semifinal game at Mount St. Joe and the cohesion of our team and the excitement of our friends. And in terms of my own personal development, those were as important as things that I, I'm so glad I wasn't playing one sport all year round and only thinking about the end game. Yeah, I do like how that's a, a part of Gilman is this, you know, we stress to play multiple different sports, right? And you know, maybe you're an all-star basketball player, but you're also on the on the tennis team in the spring, and I think that's that's really healthy. Yes. So, a, a couple other things I think would be helpful to discuss. Um, what I've learned about working with boards and what the role of a board is, and a little bit about um, the very high levels of turnover right now in heads of independent schools, which is very troubling to me and I think bad for our industry. Um, Suffield has 30 trustees, about half are um, alums and half are current or past parents. And then we have two educators. We have a peer school head and a university president. And um, they really have three areas of focus, so just as the trustees of Gilman have. One is helping shape the philosophy of the school. So if you ask any of them about what Suffield like, they would say the things I said rigor, structure, supportive, encouraging, immaculate. Um, second, they um, support, evaluate, and um, hire the head of school. So they are my supervisor, and then I lead the, the faculty and staff here. And then third, they help manage and build our financial foundation, our financial investments, our annual budget. Uh, so they're, they're overseeing, they have a fiduciary responsibility for the school. And when the boards are healthy, they're really focused on those three areas. They're keenly aware of the feel and culture of the school. They're present in the life of the school, but they're not um, picking the textbooks or telling the dean which teacher we should hire. They're really staying into those three big picture areas, which are ultimately essential for the destiny and future of the school. So I find as a school head often my frame of reference in the boards is different than a parent or sometimes a colleague when they'll say, we should really do this and or, or this person shouldn't be the coach. And I'll say, well, maybe you're right. And maybe we'll change that in four or five years. Because I'm looking out 25, 50 years for what, where do we want Suffield to be? Um, the second th the second topic is um, the average tenure for a head of school is about five to seven years, which seems pretty short. And what we've seen in the last five years is about a third don't make it through the third year, which is shocking. But some of it is um, pandemic related, but it predated the pandemic as well. And I don't know all the reasons. I would have some subjective thoughts about it, having done this for a while. But I do know, having worked with several doctoral students on this topic of what leads to successful headships and what are the factors that go into uh, being a school head, there are three clear points that are um, lead to success. The first is the relationship between the head and the president of the board. That I really, um, that's the only place I can go with things that are bothering me. I, I can't go to colleagues to talk about other colleagues. So I can go to my wife or the president of the board and, and that relationship has to be really rock solid. The second is um, a inspiring sense of purpose. You have to really believe strongly in, in, the desk, in what you're doing and the philosophy and where you're trying to take the institution. And then the third, which is interesting, is really understanding that um, work-life balance is not an option if you want this job, this is the wrong job for that. And there's all kinds of jobs that that might work, but this is this is full investment, whether it's August, November, January, whether the students are here or not, your life doesn't really change dramatically. And, and you have to embrace that. And that I think quite honestly is unappealing to, to a lot of people. I hear that. That's interesting because I would think I would think if you are applying for a head of school position, you know, you know at least one or two of those, I mean, and you probably know all three. But you know that you're going to be all in. You know that you need to have a close relationship with the head of the board, and you, you know, 
you know that you have to have a vision that aligns with uh, uh, the school itself and is going in the same direction. So the fact that there's so much turnover, as you said, is, is still interesting. Yes, it is. It's baffling. Now, um, often when a school is hiring a new head, there's a problem. So that problem might not be fixed just by getting a new head. So they're not all as fortunate as some of the stronger schools or where a successful uh, head retires. Or, so who knows what digs into it? I just know that those are the three most common themes that seem to arise for those that have a longer tenure. So the bond between the head of the, the president of the board and the head of school, um, how does that develop and grow? Because that seems like such a key uh, aspect of the direction of the school. And how do you find the right combination and how do you sh derive the same vision and kind of share the same path forward with, with somebody like that? Because that seems, that seems essential. It is. And, it, uh, you know, it's not up to the head. It's up to the board. So that the head will have, uh, certainly have input and suggestions and um, requests, but ultimately two things have to happen. The board has to support who the leader will be, and the leader has to want to serve in that role. It's a demanding volunteer role. Uh, it's slightly different at Southfield than at Gilman because uh, our board is not living in the community. So our board, just like our students, are from around the country, and we meet on campus three times a year for two days, from Friday lunch through Saturday lunch. Uh, but I'm probably in touch with our board president by phone or text three or four days a week throughout the year uh, about school or personal matters. Because, again, he's, he's, he's one of the few that's asking me how I'm doing and how our family's doing. And because my role is to make sure everybody else here is doing well so it's not just their investment in the school it's their commitment to, to the head personally so in your 20 year tenure what have been the most kind of difficult issues in a broad sense at, as you're running a school like what has been and i'm sure COVID is one of those but like what are the major challenges to your position um, the first part of my tenure, which was um, really exciting because I it was um, I didn't know if we could do it. So there was this um, and it was shaped when I was a coach of, a, of the lacrosse team. We had a good team in the late 90s and we were playing a really good team. And I thought we could beat them. And I drove them over to the school and uh, we got off. The, I we, we drove over to the school. We got off the bus and our kids mouths dropped at how nice their school was that they had, it was well before most had turf fields and field houses. And that always bothered me and it always inspired me as the head. And I thought, we're gonna have all that stuff. I don't ever want a kid to feel that way. So that was the first probably 10 years of my tenure. And whenever we reach a point where I was like, I don't know how we're ever gonna get this building built, we get some good break. Somebody would step up and help us because we were able to do all this without borrowing money. So there was just some point but that was hard because it was very uncertain and i wanted to get it done for our students and my colleagues and i wanted to see the progress of the school um then then it was the last two years felt like about five years mm -hmm. in some ways it was invigorating for me because i've been doing this a long time and my playbook had to change a little bit but nearly all of my meetings were about epidemiology and testing and keeping social distancing and how to keep the place running. And when we went hybrid, we had kids in nine different time zones. So we had kids logging into class from Bangkok at two o'clock in the morning. Oh, right. So it Jeez. was, it was, it was different. Um, and now I find this part very challenging of um, positioning and sustainability and I'm seeing a light at the end of the tunnel because now I'm getting back to things like families being upset that their child was deferred or waitlisted somewhere. And it's not as much about whether we're going to have school in person or online. And it's, it's more things I'm good at managing and can bring some perspective to. Love it. Um, I'd like to ask you a little bit about fundraising and how early on in your career you, you really learned about fundraising or learned about, um, 
working with development because that's something that you've obviously been very successful at at Suffield. And I'm curious, what are the keys and the lessons that you've learned along the way about that that area of running a school? Um, you learn um, quickly when you're doing capital construction, like major multi-million dollar buildings about the 90-10 rule, that, that most of those funds are gonna come from a very small group of people. But you also learn at the same time that building the level of support for the school of the alumni, so we increased alumni giving from about 20 to 40% and parent giving from about 50 to 80. Uh, that builds a great sense of spirit. And those are not huge dollars, but they are really symbolic of the momentum of the school. And those inspire some of those big donors. When you can say, look, everybody's on board, but you have a wherewithal that most people don't have. And, and with several of those people, I'm not asking them to change their lifestyle. They have, they have philanthropic funds to give away. I'm just I'm trying to inspire them to move Suffield to the top of the list along with some of their other priorities. Excellent. Love that. Yeah. I mean, it really boils down to it's your love of the school, your passion for the school, the fact that you're all in on this vision that you have. And I think that reverberates and is contagious. There's no question that the best way to raise money is to have a great school. Love it. Every parent wants their child to say, I love my school. The teachers are good. I feel safe and wanted here. There's nothing better. So that's, that's at the heart of it. So, Charlie, uh, one of the things that we do is the book recommendation. And I was curious if you were able to select a book. You're an English guy, English teacher, English major. What did you uh, choose for today? I found a book that's well off the beaten path, but it will be a real joy to the Gilman community, I think. And it's called Summers with Percy. And the author is none other than Reddy Finney. Wow. And one of the things I learned later in um, my relationship with Mr. Finney before he passed is that he and his family have a long connection to Maine and particularly mid coast Maine, which is where my family through my in-laws and now um, me and Hillary and our, our kids have a, a connection to mid coast Maine. And, and with Mr. Finney, it was Mount Desert Island where um, his in-laws, the Browns had a home. And the book is about a man named Percy Reed who, and his relationship with Edward Brown, who was Mr. Finney's father-in-law and about Maine and specifically about Mount Desert Island. And Percy was a man who had very little formal education, but was incredibly smart and talented and in tune with the natural world. And in the book, um, he was a caretaker of the Finney's home in Mount Desert Island. So when they were in Maryland for most of the year, Percy was taking care of the home. And then in the summer, he would teach them a lot about landscaping and flowers and trees. And um, in the book, through Percy, Mr. Finney really analyzes uh, incredibly valuable questions about the forces that help shape kind, responsible, caring people and the similarities between people in this case edward brown and percy reed with very different life journeys but very similar values so it's it's a very powerful book it's it's a little hard to get your hands on so i'd encourage the gilman family to look around the internet and find some good used book dealers but it's wow. well worth it i had no idea that mr finney wrote a book yeah, where, you where, wrote it in retirement. Where did you uh, Where did you pick it up? Um, I believe that he told me about it near the end of his life. We were, I think, we were talking about Maine, and we figured out the connection we had. Our family's home is in Cushing, which is next to Rockland. It's in the middle of the coast, and his is a little further north. Wow, love that. Well, well thank and you. And as for a kid, I didn't know that he would. Um, he would go to Maine in July. I thought he was a Gilman every day, picking up the trash. <laughs> so I was refreshed to know that he would actually recharge a little bit. Yep, yep, that's awesome. And I know Ned Emla, who uh, who teaches here, who's 
who's Mr. Finney's grandson, he goes up to Maine. The whole family goes up in the summertime for a few weeks. So, yeah, I'll have to pick up that, that book. That sounds awesome. I'll send, I have a few copies. I'll send you one. That would be great. Well, thank you so much for uh, for coming in for, for the conversation today. It was great to see you in person and, and learn a little bit about your career, your time at Gilman, and you know some of the memories that you have here um, and, and the awesome stuff that you're doing at Selffield. So I really appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm, I'm always watching from afar. I'm obviously not real tuned. My brother David lives in Baltimore and sees some of his Gilman friends, but I watch some of the games on the stream and – try to check out what's happening, but I'm always rooting for the Greyhounds and the destiny of the school is really important to me. What was the, what was lacrosse like when you were here? It was uh, upper middle of the league. Yeah. Yeah. Were you at attackman? I was, I was in with David Gaines who was just learning. And then I, I think he told me he was on this. He obviously had an illustrious career He's and we had a lot of good players in the class ahead of us, Brian Volker and Clark White and Brent Powell and, there were a lot of good players in that era. And uh, Brooks Matthews, right? Oh, Brooks. Brooks was a great player, and I was so proud that he was the coach. I loved following that. Yeah, he's awesome. Well, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much again. It was great to see My you. My pleasure. Good luck with the school year. Thanks. Thank you. You too. Okay. Bye-bye.